So I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Cassis, who is on our Chromebooks for Education team, and he's going to go ahead and get started with our agenda today. Good morning. How's everyone doing? I'm excited to have you on here and uh, join us for this, this that we're doing on Chromebooks. So I want to quickly go to the agenda. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about is a little bit about what we're seeing in technology and education from a Google perspective. We've seen well schools and universities for a number of years now, and so there's definitely some patterns that we're starting to see, definitely some things that uh, uh, we see technology and an impact on, so we're excited about this space. The uh, thing we're going to talk about is what these Chromebooks are. You've heard a lot about them. Uh, heard to operate, you've heard about the management features, so we're really going to dive a little bit into what, what they can do and how the school systems they work in. And then we're going to go through some common questions. As we've launched or started talking about Chromebooks, we have a number of questions that are common, so we want to address those and make sure that we answer those up front. So we'll dive into some other questions that you might have, and then we'll spend some time answering those questions later on. And then finally, we'll have uh, James others with us from Kip who's going to talk about his experience using Chromebooks in the classroom in Kip. So let's get started. As uh, Dana mentioned, I am part of the Google Education team or the Classroom Education team now, which includes uh, books for education. And before I always like to level the, the conversation and talk about what why about technology in education. And the more important thing uh, we need to start with is that this generation growing up is growing up in a digital technology environment. They are simply born into technology that isn't necessarily new to them. They just experience technology on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example here, you know, we have this slide. I think this picture of my 10-year-old. Uh, we have a uh, philosophy in our family that you know, if uh, the kid wants to buy a book, we, we get him a book. And so we go to the store and get a book. And so here he is. He's somebody who walks into the store. He passes by the four people who are working in the border store. He passes by the actual section of the children's books. And he goes straight to the terminal. He goes straight to the technology because his brain is in search. He wants to search. And so the first thing when he thinks about search is not card catalogs or not indexes, the first thing he thinks about in search is a, ter a terminal, a computer. That's what he, he uses. And so this generation is growing up, not necessarily the generation that can multitask, because uh, you hear a lot about that, and that's not necessarily true, or the generation that is, is you know, digital literate, which is somewhat true, but this is definitely a generation that's growing up with technology background already in place. So in the next Isn't you know new to this generation. They are growing up with technology. They are growing up uh, experiencing it uh, from the from from Earth, if you will. So one of my favorite videos is from a blogger who posted uh, of him handing his child a, uh, a, a, a new tablet, and, and the child instantly knew how to use it, knew how to integrate, knew how to how, how to play with it, knew how to. Um, uh, use it in all the different ways and open applications. Uh, example that I, I always like to see is when I see parents handing their smartphones to kids to keep busy, and they immediately go to Angry Birds or they immediately go into their Fruit Ninja games or even you know learning applications that they're using to keep busy. So this is a generation that's absolutely growing up with technology. It is new to them the way it's new to us. All next slide. This generation. Is growing in the cloud. You know, cloud computing for us is new. It's a new concept. We've just been talking about it for a few years. Matter of fact, I do uh, when I do presentations. I often talk about you know cloud computing is. Well, generation doesn't think cloud computing. They're just born in it. They uh, my ten year old doesn't know that the world existed before Google. My, you know, my ten year old doesn't know that you know just a couple years ago, you know, you couldn't watch a video online or you couldn't. Download Stream a movie uh, on your on your uh, on your computer, and so generation is growing up with the expectation that computing is just the environment that they're growing up with. And 
most if you if you watch them, when you open up a computer, when you open up a laptop and they wait for minutes for the thing to boot up, the first thing that they do is they go on a browser and they, they visit the site. Uh, and you know, I don't have my ten year old but he's got about ten or twelve names and passwords for all the different uh, uh, websites that he visits. So, so next, next slide. And education hasn't kept up with this, the way technology has grown. Uh, technology has impacted all the industries, and for some reason, we haven't been able to do a good job with keeping technology um, updated in education. And so as you can see from the slide, the classroom was 1950. The arts looks very similar to the classroom that I have today. And that has changed. And so think about what we just, you know, what I just talked about, and you have my 10-year-old, and you have all these other kids who are growing in this digital environment. They're growing up with technology all around them, and they're walking into a classroom that was very similar to the classroom that we went to. So you imagine, you know, the the the, the actions that they have, you know, when they school isn't being met with what the tech, what the education environment looks like. And so, for the market, education hasn't kept up with the technology revolution in the last 10 or 20 years. And so, we need to find ways to alleviate that. Fortunately for us, next slide. We've seen in the last couple of years when it comes to technology and education. We've seen hundreds and thousands of schools and millions of students and teachers start to use technology in the classroom. Uh, from a Google perspective, you know, we're very proud of how education is using to ask for education in the classroom. We've seen schools use uh, our tools in so many different ways. And sort of the next slide you can see uh, and these are just you know some examples of how students and teachers are using technology in the classroom. And they're doing from building, teachers are building collaborative lesson plans that they can share with each other and give each other feedback on. And they're using uh, Google Docs and Google Forms and Google Spreadsheets to create side projects that they can use in the classroom for their students. And they're using Google Sheets and other things to create flashcards for, uh, for their students. Next slide. There, there are things that teachers and students are using Google Docs in the classroom that we can come up with. Uh, so our best examples and, and our best instances with these tools come from teachers, and they're using Google Forms uh, for everything from creating reading logs to assessments. They're doing pre-assessments with reading logs, and they class lectures um, with Google. So, for example, if you wanted me to come visit one of your classrooms and you, you know, Google Chat available, I can come in and do a lecture in your classroom in front of your students. You have to physically be there, and they're using uh, Google Sites and Google Docs to create student e-portfolios, where students are collecting all their information and they're creating their their portfolio of what their education experience has been. And, you know, Google Sites. And so, if you think about all these different tools that are being used in the classroom, and and again, teachers have been an amazing job coming up with different ways to use the software in the classroom. You have to ask yourself, what's missing in the classroom? And one of the things that's missing is the equipment for students to actually do these things, right? So, you know, there's a lot of schools who, have, who are trying on one programs. There's a lot of schools that are trying, uh, you know, uh, laptop carts. There's lots of schools that are trying different ways, bringing your device programs to, to, to get technology into the classroom. Because teachers are starting to see the benefit of technology in the classroom to build the skills that kids needs to be around communication and collaboration and problem solving and the building and all the things that kids need to to survive and to thrive in, in, in their in next experience. And so what we see is you know technology and education is the equipment. So we have these cloud based tools that teachers are using. We have cloud based tools that administrators will find marvelous ways to use in the classroom. We need to get equipment in the classroom. And so I see, and our team sees uh, unbelievable potential with technology uh, using Chrome classroom. 
Next slide. We're able to take, you know, this classroom that we see here, and and to the next slide, this classroom, right, where we see the thing. We still see teachers in the classroom. We still see students in the classroom. But what we see are students being and using technology to communicate, collaborate, to problem solve, to to build new and innovative ways to to manage the information and the knowledge that they need to they need to grow. So we're really excited about the Chromebook. We're really excited about what these devices can do. Uh, and it's not just a laptop. It's not just another device. We're excited for lots of different ways. And so what we want to be able to do now is talk a little bit about what these Chromebooks can do and talk about why they're different than you're, what you're typically used to and why, from a Google perspective, you know, wanted to look at this solution from a different way. And I want to introduce Jeff Peltner, who I've been working with for lots and lots of years. And he's going to talk a little bit. He's a, he's a business development manager for Chromebooks. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, what, the, what these books can do in education. Jeff? Hi, right, introduction, Jamie. Uh, and uh, good morning, afternoon, everybody out there. Um, uh, so I, I walked through a little bit today, uh, you know, kind of where we're coming from with the Chromebook solution, why we think it's really well suited to the education environment. And what we, we see uh, when we look at the challenges facing schools trying to deploy technology to classroom is a lot of challenges. Now I've got this graphic on the left, but I really think you know it only begins with the purchase of computers, right? Like a lot of people look at it and say, if I could just get computers in the classroom, uh, I would be able to, to actually access more technology for my students and more applications. But computers in the classroom aren't the end of the journey. They're actually in many ways the beginning of the journey. And so we saw this set of challenges facing schools and indeed businesses as well um, that were really trying to deploy technology more widely. And a couple of those that I think were really important were really user frustration. Technology is complex enough. I hear teachers complaining all the time about long boot times and the amount of classroom time that is spent uh, diagnosing and dealing with technology and updating and, and, and incompatibilities and all this kind of stuff. So I've got this world where I've got frustrated users, and in our case, that means classroom time that's wasted. It's being spent trying to diagnose technology issues versus imparting knowledge to students. Second, almost every school I have talked to spends the summer re-imaging the laptops that they have in the classroom, and almost they spend almost the entire summer doing this. This is a real, real challenge. It means that the folks responsible for that effort don't get to add additional value to the school year to year. They're not. They're you know in the summer they're basically just spending their time re-imaging machines. It also means for many schools that the only time that they can actually clean up a machine, diagnose issues, put new software on a machine, update the operating system in the summer. And so when things happen throughout the year, we're not able to really respond to that. Third, there's a lot of volume of support costs that go into this. So as soon as you start putting technology in the hands of users, we know this, uh, even and even Googlers who are users of technology produce a large volume of support calls around the, the usage of that technology, and we see a lot of this coming through. And this really becomes a limiting factor in many ways for how widely many districts can deploy technology. Uh, yeah, maybe I could afford more notebooks, but I can't actually handle the support of those notebooks if I were to put them in the classroom. And it's really what we see. It's, it's been too difficult to broaden the deployment to the number of students we want because of the challenges facing us with computers. And it's, it's not just the cost of purchasing them, it's really this ongoing support, maintenance, and ownership management I have to deal with and how I, how I can manage that at scale. And we really think Chromebooks are uniquely suited to address the challenges facing schools in this world of trying to deploy more technology into the classroom. So let me go through real briefly what, what technology is really behind Chromebooks at a very high level. And then if you guys have questions, we're happy to, to answer those as well. But Chromebooks are notebook computers that are built and optimized to run the web. It's essentially a very small Linux laptop running uh, a Chrome browser on top of Linux and locking the user out of doing anything that's not done through the Chrome web browser. You can't install software. You can't install device drivers. You access web applications. And we believe that web applications have become robust so that that's really all you need to access. Put this kind of technology in place, you get a couple of real key benefits that I want to talk through. One, users get to be more productive. People, uh, usually from the people we've talked to, they love these devices because they boot quickly, uh, and the users just kind of get quickly to what they're doing. They're easy to manage. And I'm going to walk through this in some more detail, but we have integrated from the ground up the concept of managing these devices from the cloud so that you can very, very easily manage uh, a large number of devices. And we really hope that this means you can use the same IT staff that might be able to manage 100 or 200 deployment laptops today and manage literally thousands with the same support. 
forward, we think they'd be easy to support. Uh, one of our commercial customers has actually told us that uh, within a month's time span, they had a, a set of a set of users running Windows laptops and a set running Chromebooks. They got 70 support tickets from the Windows group and none from the Chromebook group. Its ability to scale easily without massive support costs because of the ease of use for users is, I think, really important. And all this put together, we really think means it's going to be simpler to, simpler to scale. And we really hope uh, that as you work, look at Chromebooks and start working with them, you'll find these help you put more devices in front of more students and more schools without substantially increasing your costs. And that's really, at the end of the day, the vision we have for where Chromebooks are going. So I want to talk in a little bit more uh, detail about specifically why I think these are great in the classroom environment. I talked about, you know, more productive users, what does it mean in a classroom environment? The, uh, these devices boot cold in less than eight seconds. They resume with network connectivity in less than two, which means when you walk into a classroom, uh, you pretty much are, are at work in a lesson as soon as you get that, that laptop open in front of a student's desk versus, you know, in a traditional PC environment, you can wait substantial amounts of time uh, to get that device actually ready to go. It, they rest eight to eight and a half hours on a battery. Battery. And so uh, in many cases, we're seeing schools not worry about charging them through the day. They figure the number of classroom experiences I have in the day, I don't need to charge them. I don't have to worry about putting them into a cart and out of a cart between classes, which just eats up valuable classroom time. I can actually let this thing go all day and a single battery life. Uh, experience everywhere. So a really unique thing about Chromebooks, for all the apps for education customers, you may have seen some of this already, but when you log into a Chromebook, with a Google with a Google account, all of your bookmarks, all of your applications, all of your personalized settings and preferences, all of them follow you to absolutely any device. So a student who's using two, three, four different devices throughout the day will find the exact same experience facing them at every device they interact with, making it much, much easier than in a traditional world to go between multiple computers throughout your computing experience throughout the day. And related to that, these are very easy to share. So in the world where we've got multiple users accessing computers, whether it's a computer lab or whether it's just computers tied to a classroom versus tied to a student, uh, when a student logs in, it doesn't matter who's been on this before. Not only do I have my experience, but I have none of the remnants of the user to use this. And so if I have five users using using one Chromebook, I'm not worried about files being left and found by other students. I'm not worrying about challenges of that user finding what they need. As soon as they log in, they get their experience and only their experience. So these are very well suited to environments where laptops are being handed around. And in fact, our team has taken to calling them interchangeable. I don't want them disposable. You can't throw them away. They do cost money. Uh, but you can pick up any Chromebook and it's instantly yours, and it doesn't matter who else's it was before. And I think this is a really unique element of what we're doing. And I think very, very well suited for you in many of the school cases as we've seen. The um, second thing I talked about, really easy to manage Chromebooks. And so I'm going to talk about this a little bit and a couple of the things we've done. So number one, we built a web-based management console into here so you can configure and customize your Chromebooks through the cloud. It's integrated into the Google Apps Management Console and allows you to, with a couple of checkboxes and, and text menus, enter the settings you want. And all of your users that are logging into Chromebooks are going to see those settings applied. And I've got another slide that will go through this in a little bit more detail. Um, so you can really, uh, for the web, customize and do a lot of these things to really make this experience custom to your users. Um, security built in. So I want to talk about these next two points in a little bit of detail as well. Security. We have a very unique security profile on the Chromebooks. It does a couple of things. Number one, it makes the, the devices very resistant to malware and viruses. Because the user does not have permissions to install, download, or, or run any application that's not a web application, there's no real concern about a virus infecting the computer. In fact, every time the computer is booted, it checks to see if the operating system has been modified, if a third-party application has been added, and if so, it'll actually remove that from the device and reinstall the OS clean. So you've got a world where you no longer need to worry about what are my students downloading, what are they doing. I think it's really important uh, for keeping a clean environment in your classrooms for computers. And they're also forever fresh. Unlike a traditional PC environments where it takes actually work on each individual machine to update the operating system, Chromebooks update themselves in the background and apply the updates every time the device is rebooted. We update the OS about every six weeks in small increments, and there's literally no intervention from IT and nothing but a reboot at the classroom level needed to get these devices up to date. So you never again have to worry about what version of the OS I, am I on, how do I get it to the next version, is there compatibility with my applications? These devices are intended to be forever fresh for all of your use cases. Um, 
So I talked a little bit about the management, and I want to talk a little bit about what's included in that management just to kind of understand where we're coming from and what I think this can really make, uh, how it can make your lives better. Number one, a customized experience for your users, auto-configured with perhaps a school-specific theme, the applications that you use, whether it's Gmail and Docs or other third-party applications, things like Khan Academy and extensions. Uh, what it really means is without imaging the machine when it comes in and without re-imaging it, you can put all of these things onto every PC in your environment with a couple of clicks of the mouse at a web-based console. So all you do is you go to the web, you tell them what applications you want, you click a button, and within about a half an hour, every Chromebook in your environment will set up application on their desktop uh, without having to go do anything to the machines. So you never have to go back and manually re-image these machines after you've deployed them to the classroom. Uh, because OS auto updates with no IT intervention, you now never have to manually patch or update or go in and install or, or anything software or OS or browser on any PC in your environment. So these will just automatically work all the time. Virus resistance built in. So with verified boot, I don't have to think about do I am I installing antivirus software? Do I have anti malware? Is the virus definition file up to date? Right. All of that is taken care of automatically at the core level by the OS. And the last thing we have here. Uh, when you configure these from the cloud, one of the key things you can configure from an educational point of view is proxy settings. And these are settings that a user does not have, that no user on the device has permission to change once you set them from the cloud. And so if you've got a web filtering based on a proxy, we can enforce that not only while the devices are at the school, but anywhere this device happens to go, we can push that through whatever web filtering proxy you're using. So this can be very, very important in, in helping make sure that the mechanisms you put in place to keep your students safe are being effective on the Chromebook. What is the uh, package and what is the offering? Uh, what we've got is all the things that Jamie and I have talked about, the kind of the familiar user interface, the great classroom use experience with battery life, fast boot, instant personalization. Um, you know, it's just a browser, so people are used to it. It's very easy to use and very easy to support. And what we've done for schools is actually produce a kind of combined offering. So it includes the book and the operating system. It also includes a, a hardware warranty for the lifespan of the device. So if anything is uh, warranty-wise, manufacturing-wise wrong or defective about the device, you can return it and Google will replace it during the three-year lifespan. It includes phone and email-based support. So if anything goes wrong literally from the hardware uh, through the operating system through the browser. If you have any issues, you just call us and we will help you take care of them. And the user and device configuration and management capability I've talked about, where you can really uh, control the experience in, in, that you're having and customize and configure those devices simply through the cloud. And we've wrapped that into a single monthly price. So the, for $20 per month and $23 per month, if you'd like uh, a Verizon and uh, AT&T 3G card integrated into the devices, uh, you get all of these pieces, the device itself, the warranty, the support, and the management. And we think this is pretty much an entire computing environment with all the elements you need to manage that environment uh, across your across your classrooms, excepting, of course, the software you want to use uh, for a simple $20 a month fee. And at the end of the year, you actually get to keep the devices, so you do own these devices from the day that you start the subscription plan. Uh, we will stop supporting them, but we'll send you a new one if you keep paying the fee. So for 20 bucks a month uh, forward, you can essentially will always have a most recent laptop with the most recent OS in a supported and managed environment. We think this is a really compelling combined offering that should make it very, very easy for you to get from one vendor all of the pieces you need to manage, class, to manage laptops across a wide number of, of classrooms. Uh, we will also talk about uh, kind of some of the top questions we get about Chromebooks for education uh, and uh, kind of what, what's in class, some of the just kind of key FAQs that you get. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie uh, to talk about, uh, you know, some of the key questions we get asked by schools about specifically the educational offering for Chromebooks. Yeah, and you know, Jeff, both Jeff and I can kind of cover this uh, to, to address some of the issues that we see here. The, the, the key thing for us is, you know, we release these Chromebooks. We absolutely understand some of the key questions that are coming in and some of the key issues that some of our users are going to be facing, and we want to be able to address those. And the irony for me, or the, the coincidence for me, is that this is very similar to two years ago when we released, you know, Google Apps for Education for K-12 and all the different questions that we were getting. So um, we absolutely understand that there's some key questions out there, so we want to address those. So let's start with answering those up front. Um, so first one, the first big question that we get a lot from is, you know, can I get these Chromebooks from Amazon for my school? Absolutely, you can buy them, but you're not. That's not what we're talking about here. We see you know, the 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 beauty of these machines in, in in the things that Jeff just talked about, the management capabilities, the things that you can do at the end level with, 
with these machines. As Jeff mentioned, you know, go out and buying five machines uh, is, is an easy solution. Going and getting 5,000 machines for a school system is a little more complex. And so, you know, just as you deal with years of buying any, any, any device for your classroom, uh, you see the beauty of these machines in the actual uh, management functionalities that, that you get with these Chromebooks. So you can go buy it at Amazon, but we don't recommend that. We recommend to, that you look seriously at the management capabilities that you're getting with these. And, and more so, right now, it's not possible to roll these uh, into the management program if you buy them on your own. Um, so that answers the question about buying, buying the machines straight up. Next slide. All right, so these machines, and one of the cool things about these machines is they have 3G capability. And, and what that means is, you know, one of the, the limitations of one-on-one -on -one programs, especially in, um, in areas where you don't have families that have uh, Wi-Fi connections at home or don't have internet, internet access at home. And you can look at the statistics, you can see, you know, all, all the things that are involved with whether or not a family has Wi-Fi or doesn't have Wi-Fi, and absolutely poverty and is, is one of the issues around the ability to have Wi-Fi. So these machines actually come with 3G. And so you will be able to get 100 megabytes, you know, per month for two years, uh, which is included with the, with the 3G Chromebooks. Uh, but in addition to that, you can actually purchase uh, increments with a monthly plan. And so absolutely, we have a, a site here, and, and as Dana mentioned, these slides will be available to you where you can get more information. And I know lots of schools are looking at lots of different ways, and we'd love to hear some of your ideas, some of your feedback on the best to take advantage of the 3G capability on the 3G uh, Chromebooks. Next slide. So this was always a big question. So does Google ensure my Chromebook in case a student leaves one out in the rain, uh, or drops it, or brings it to lunch and spills their, you know, latte all over it, or any other uh, of the number of issues that can happen? And the simple answer is that the Chromebooks have a warranty, and they do cover hardware man and, and manufacturing defects. Uh, someone told me a great story about how. how uh, you know, there's a school that had, I'm not going to, you know, name the devices, but they had these devices in their classroom, and all students had little plastic cups next to their desks because that would put the keys that would fall from the machines uh, uh, into, uh, and, and we want that to happen. And so if these things aren't working, or if, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if the hardware is not working, and, the, and there's defects, and the, and the screen isn't working, or the things flap down, or whatever issues you have with these devices, we absolutely cover those under the warranty, but they're not an insurance plan, and they're not going to protect these machines from theft. They're not going to protect the machines from, you know, throwing one across the yard. So um, we understand that that that's an issue, and you know, I the schools that I've been talking to is I've been trying to get some information as to how they currently manage any computers that they have in the classroom from an, you know an insurance perspective. But they do definitely do not. Um, Protect the warranty does not protect accidental damage. Next, next slide. Yeah, you know, we think about God and we think that if we're in the cloud, we can't print, and these devices can't print, and these these, uh, these Chromebook can absolutely print. So you can via the cloud to any printer that's set up on a Google Cloud Print. And again, you know, there's a great illustration here of how it works. But the Google Print is a cloud-based uh, solution that helps you print to any device that's part of this. And again, there's a link there to google.com cloud print that explains how to do this, and, and it's great. I you know, again, uh, would love to see the education world get to the point where they're not printing a lot of things. I understand that, the, that it's a necessity, but again, the, the, some of the things that we're seeing in education are great, especially for paperless environments where teachers don't have to hand out quizzes uh, paper. They don't have to make you know a hundred copies of a quiz. They they do they do the quiz using Google Forms, and the students automatically use their devices to log in, answer questions, and the answers go straight to a spreadsheet, and the, and the teacher just reads the spreadsheet. And so the great solutions inside you know these books if you're using cloud-based applications that help you avoid having to print a lot, but you can absolutely print from these. Next slide. 
All right, um, we're, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Sanders here, who's a teacher at KIPP Academy. He's been uh, using these uh, Chromebooks for uh, a number of months now, and he has some great experiences uh, with these devices. So I want to turn it over uh, to Mr. Sanders here, who's going to talk about his Chromebook experience. Hello, um, Mr. Sanders here. Before we get started, uh, we have this uh, short video that kind of gives you some context um, of our, uh, the Chromebook program that we've used in our classroom for the past six months. So I'm going to play that for you right now. Charters that was founded in 2003. It goes from 5th to 8th grade, and 300 C students have enrolled this year. If there's, no, if there's no software installed, there's no imaging that needs to be done. Once they're set up and deployed, the updates are really happening on their own. The less administrative overhead and burden you have to manage the computers, the more computers you can put out in the classroom and sustain and maintain over time. We walk into the social studies class, we grab a computer, we go to Mr. Sanders' blog that he created the day before, and we follow the tasks or steps that are set. My is entirely run online, and so my course has shifted from more of a direct instruction model, and then the students do some type of graphic organizer, some type of assignment, to a more interactive based model where the students are actually required to think independently, create, collaborate rather than just memorize and regurgitate. I think it's definitely a better model for learning. The learning becomes more authentic. There's so much information, so many different ways to approach a topic. In print form, I would have to give them one, maybe two articles. And I can say, here's a list of 15 articles in their summary. There's now an increase in personal investment because there's more choice. And when there's an increase in personal investment, there's definitely an increase in what they produce, which increases achievement. For you to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with your teacher rather than sitting in class using your hand all day and never get called on, I think that's just very All my assignments in Google Docs are all stored and it's not all unorganized and I can easily send it to my teacher. It gives us open access to different applications and programs such as Google Moderator where we can vote on different ideas that our teammates give us. There are different ways you can make presentations using the actual presentation mode on the documents in your Gmail. I think our grades are going to go up. The Google Chrome notebooks, they're very unique. They create the next generation of computers. Well, watching that video definitely makes me uh, miss my students now a lot more than I was about an hour ago. Um, so, have you guys just kind of a, a background about how the uh, Chromebooks have changed the flow of my classroom and definitely changed um, instruction? So, before the Chrome I think the real computer for a classroom was the uh, base model, base model book for about $1,000. And we did a set of HPs in our classroom, and we would use the computers. It would be an event. We would check out the laptop cart. We'd go into our classroom. We'd create, you know, lay all the different power cords and whatnot, and really try to make sure all the computers are charged, and if not, they're close to the wall so that it can be plugged in. And it just, I found it was so cumbersome to use computers and technology in my classroom, and even though I'm a big fan of technology, it just wasn't worth my time, and it wasn't worth the loss of instructional time. So now in my classroom, what I have is a stack of Chromebooks sitting next to my door, and they walk in, they grab a Chromebook, they go to the seat, they open and log in with their Google account, and from that point, from walking to the door, to be in their seat seated, ready to start class, takes about a minute. It's me about 72 minutes of instructional time times 73. Because to shut on the Chromebook, all my students have to do is click and hold the power button. It shuts down. It logs them off completely. So all their information is safe. They walk back to the door on their way out and set the computer down. And that's such an advantage because really, with the Chromebook, technology gets out of the way. And it enables me to do a lot of the projects that I've always wanted to do. Um, but it was just so much time and effort to use another device. Walk in, they go to the website, and this is the first thing they see. And depending on what activity they do, they can either check their homework, check their grades, or click on today's history lesson. They get into the lesson, and I decided to run my entire class 
through Logger Blog. Um, I put the standard there. As you can see, I have the aim of the day, and then I'm a series of five, five tasks. So the first task is to go in, submit their homework, and that's a Google form, so I'm no longer walking around the room needing to collect homework, which gives me time to be able to sit down next to a student, work with them, give them feedback, turn them, figure out what they need in terms of support from me. The second thing is we do some type of a quick question. I so use using Google Moderator for this because it fills a lot of discussion. And it's a lot of fun. If you haven't checked it out, I really encourage you to check it out. So here is the me collecting work form. I use the Google Forms, like I said. And it really just simplifies my process. So if you look at my desk now, whereas last year you would see piles and piles of papers, and assignments would definitely go ungraded. If, as they stack up, I'd have to just prioritize. Now, like they're all sitting in Google account. I can go from home. I can go in from anywhere. And just make things a lot easier. Here's a sample of the quick question I did on June 10th in Google Moderator. Students went in, submitted ideas, and then they go in and they vote. 826 votes. It just shows you how much thinking and processing went on on behalf of my students because, because of technology, it gives them more time to spend in programs like Google Moderator rather than having to sit in the back of the room, raise your hand, wait for a teacher to call on you getting that feedback. It just takes so much time to do those things, and you really don't know if every student is participating through the traditional hand-raising method. Through the technology, they go, I can see whether they did the work or not, and it's right there in front of me. So I think the technology and the case Chromebooks, just using technology in the classroom is so much easier. Because really, I think about stuff that I want to use in my class, and everything's on the web. You have the Chrome browser, you have different Google apps for education, and the web store. So a couple examples of projects I've done in my classroom and how the books made that possible. The is I decided one morning that I wanted to use some type of drawing software for my students to create Japanese geography art. And I was going through trying to figure out what the best one was, and I had decided on a solution I had written up my lesson plan, and last minute I was like, oh no, this DeviantArt program in the web store would be a lot better. If I'm any other type of computer, a piece of software installed on every single computer would have been at least a full day process trying to pull out the computers, log in, download the software, install the disk, and get everything up and running. With web store, I was able to say, hey guys, quick to the web store, type in DeviantArt, install the program, and in about 60 seconds to two minutes, all of my students had the software that previously wasn't on the computer row. So example of Kyra and Kojo's Japanese geography. So easy, we could do it. The art took me 10, 15 minutes, and then it led us to have time to do much of the writing afterwards, the processing and discussing the art, and talking about how this type of art connects back to medieval Japanese culture. The other thing I found using the web rather than have it on the hard drive was just being able to access older files no matter where you are and whenever you wanted to do it. The project that I did that lasted the course of the six months that I was using the Chromebooks in my classroom was keeping track of the different social structures in empires or civilizations that we were studying. For example, here's a slide that one of my students made breaking down the Aztec social structure. Learning about the Mayan social structure, he created another slide. When we went to medieval Japan, he created another slide. Because all online, we were able to go back whenever we wanted to and do those level thinking tasks where we compare and contrast the different social societies, have discussions, because the technology got out of the way. We didn't carry around flash drives. We didn't have to figure out where files were saved, about whose computer was which. So that, that burden of additional computers in the classroom was, was gone, and I was able to just get at my content, and that made things so much nicer. Uh, other things that we were able to do was just use the video camera to create simple videos, get straight up to YouTube, where my students were able to express themselves creatively. If we were going to some type of video creation project in the past, using additional cameras, 
using traditional video editing software. It just takes so much time. And the cross saved me time and I could do some of these projects or project-based learning that teachers really want to do, but we know as teachers we don't have time to do them. All, I had all of my students create individual online portfolios in Blogger, and we were able to save our work using programs like Prezi, Google Presentation, Google Draw, DeviantArt, anything was able to just instantly publish straight to their blog, link to it in their blog. One of the cool projects that we did was we went around and we found 10 examples of Renaissance art. All the students created a presentation showcasing 10 pieces of Renaissance art. And on their blog all up and running, I played on Pandora, some type of classical music in my classroom. And we had this virtual art gallery walk where we would go click on people's different art galleries, go through them, and then in the blog, we'd be able to comment on, on them. Something like that either on paper or on another type of offline device would just be impossible. And it just, I think, brought my classroom alive. It was easy for my students to understand. Automatically full screen. Everything automatically right there in front of them. They click and they go straight to mail. So if they click on a mail link, it doesn't open up some type of mail software. It doesn't open up some type of third party app that they don't understand. Everything's simple. Everything's right there. My students were able to pick it up just to introduce anything else, maybe one or two days. They were good to go. Whereas if we're using some type of other computer, it would take a lot longer. In my classroom, I wouldn't have to worry about charging. I had one power strip behind my desk, six chargers plugged in, and whenever I would think about it, I'd charge some computers. But really, I use about five and a half hours a day, so I got about two full days of use out of them. It's of instructional time, like I talked about earlier. It really made things easier, and the whole thing for me was humanizing my classroom, the technology, getting out of the way, and being able to spend that time with my students. That's really important. So that was my experience in the classroom using the Chromebooks. Um, I definitely think they've replaced other computers in terms of what a teacher to use in the classroom, and they definitely increased my instructional time. So thank you so much. All right, what well, uh, reaches the end of the prepared portion of the, uh, the day, which makes for the more fun part of the day, which is the live Q&A. So I think uh, we're going to start putting some questions off of the uh, WebEx Q&A and just answering uh, kind of the key questions. We've been trying our best to keep up with uh, Q&A uh, them here as they've been coming in, and I'm just going to actually turn and look at some of these questions and figure out which ones we should answer. There's, uh, I've got a question here from Cecilia for uh, for Mr. Sanders. I love the teachers; everybody's Mr. We don't we don't do any Misters here at Google, so I I kind of like hearing that the Mr. Sanders. Question from Mr. Sanders: The student only used the device in the classroom. What type of homework did he assign? Would it require personal access at home? And did you use traditional textbooks? The internet access um, in my school in South Central LA, I found that not all my students had access to the web at home and the library access next door was really limited. So about 65% of my students could use the internet at home. So what I did was kind of fun was, I, the only way, the only reason why I used my um, textbook was for homework. And to sign a page out of the textbook, I would have an online equivalent, you know, going through the same information. But I also had an assignment that the students could do on paper at home. So the first thing that they did, you saw it said submit homework. That my students who, who couldn't do the homework assignment um, on a computer, and they would just type in their responses. And it was the same thing for my students who did do it online. I would just scan a PDF, upload it to Google Docs, and share it on my website. So that I did have the computer, we could save little trees here and there. Um, it made it a lot simpler. So I did use the textbook, but only for homework. And then in my classroom, it was more project-based learning and some of those type of interactive activities around collaboration and whatnot. Another set of questions that, uh, that has come up regularly throughout, so I thought it would be worth addressing, is the question of the monthly fee versus the upfront payment, and if an upfront payment is something we support. And also kind of the questions around, is this an operating or a capital expense? I know some of you have budgets for capital expenditures versus operating expenses. Which does this fall into? Um, this is, the program is not a lease. It is actually essentially an installment payment plan, and transfer of ownership of the devices happen in the very beginning of the, of the contract. And so most of our accounting team believes, and this is up to your accounting team, how you account 
for the expense, not us. But our planning team does believe that it will often count as a capital expense because of the transfer of ownership on day one. So you probably can can get access to capital dollars for this. Uh, and if you want to pay up front, it's essentially just sum the payments. 36 times uh, 20 is 720. So we charge you the uh, full amount up front, and then that's good for three years. So I know some of you also have pools of money that need to be spent in certain defined time periods and not necessarily the ongoing regular budgeting that you'd like for that. So it is certainly uh, available to you uh, to do an upfront payment option instead. Uh, proxy question for Jamie or Ben. Uh, I don't know if the Chromebook is a location aware for a one-to-one -one laptop program. I understand that the Chromebook can be centrally managed with the proxy server on campus, but what happens when a student goes home? Um, so Jamie can answer this, but I can answer this as well. Um, a couple things. One, configuration of which proxy you use. Uh, it is done centrally through the cloud. So as long as there's a connection to Google, that policy will be applied to the device and will actually apply anywhere the student goes. It's not based on where the laptop is as far as which policy is applied. It's based on the user that authenticates. And so I, I want to be clear about something. Not today, but in the near future, you'll be able to actually set different policies for different user groups. So potentially having a certain web filter that your students are required to go through on Chromebooks, but perhaps your faculty don't have to go through. Um, that's something you'll be able to use. These are user-based policies, not location-based policies. And we're also working on things like location awareness of the devices in the management console. So the concept of who last authenticated to the device, where is it, that kind of thing, is something we are working towards in the management console as well, um, but a little different than the question that was asked. Um, question, Paul, who sets up the Google accounts that the students use? How are the accounts tied to a set of Chromebooks? Um, Paul, the, the, uh, the, the accounts are set up by you. Um, this is through something very, very similar to the Google Apps for Education project. And if you are a Google Apps for Education customer, it is actually integrated. So the accounts are simply Google Apps for Education accounts. Um, the way to connect them, when you actually, what, what will happen when you get the device, you hit a particular key sequence sequence the first time you load the device and you type in essentially a user within your domain. And so if it's, um, you know, google.com, if it, it's not going to be google.com, I'm trying to think of a good school. If it's su.edu, I'm going to go to the, my first class for education customer. You can have su.edu becomes the owner. And then from within the management console, you can start to dictate who can log into your Chromebooks. If it's anybody in the world, including a Gmail account or me as a Google.com user, is it only the users within my ASU.edu community or just five users I'm piloting that I want to be able to access? That you can dictate once you've authenticated into the device, uh, and, and you do that through the Cloud Management Console, and then for the devices that have been connected to your domain, um, those restrictions will apply. So here we go. Do you, do you happen to know and that issues of WebEx here, if we can purchase the Verizon 3G model and then use our own eligible discount plan to purchase the data? Uh, the answer is yes, you'll need to work with Verizon on that. Um, each 3G capable device in the United States comes with a CDMA chip, which will operate with Verizon 3G, and an unlocked GSM capability. So you can put in, let's say, an AT&T SIM and get 3G connectivity from AT&T. Um, now, the Verizon plans, we have the kind of pre-configured plans Jamie talked about. If you call your Verizon rep, it is possible for them to move um, the devices from the kind of prepaid, consumer-oriented individual plan to a existing post-pay uh, plan that you may have negotiated with them, and that's something you'll have to work out with them. We, we, we aren't in the middle of that transaction in any way. We are working with Verizon very closely to make it as easy as possible to do that. I will not claim that we are at the point we would like in terms of the ease of doing that. Certainly, we always want to make it as simple as possible. So you'll see us continue to try and find ways to make that easier. Uh, but it is possible to be done today. Question from David. Uh, okay, I, I don't, I'm not offended by crass, David. If we want to pilot a program for 30 days or less, does Google have a return policy before we make the long-term investment? Uh, the unfortunate answer to this point is no, we don't. Um, so there is, you can a small number of units if you'd like to trial them for a period of time, but we do not have a kind of return policy at this time uh, if you don't like the units. Uh, David also asks, what is the state of the Citrix integration? Uh, it's a good question. So Citrix is something we're working very closely on. And um, at this point, it is, in, it is a product that they are working to deliver, and we expect that to be done sometime later this year. I have seen uh, demos. We have some uh, 
instances running here internally at Google. So it's worked. We've demoed it publicly. Um, but exactly when that will release is up to Citrix, not Google. And so I ask you to, if, you're, if you are a Citrix customer, call your Citrix rep and ask them that question. Uh, I don't feel comfortable committing to a timeline for the release of a product by another company. I barely feel comfortable committing to the release of timelines for products that Google's working on. But, uh, but for a third party, it certainly is even less comfortable for me. Hey, I was uh, scanning through some of the questions and sort of trying to summarize into like big buckets, and one of them is around uh, uh, the, uh, cloud print and paperless and how kind of, you know some examples of how that all works. And you can absolutely get more information from that web address that I mentioned there to get information about uh, cloud print. But I, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm seeing out there, and I'm sure some of you are seeing this too, around how people are using the cloud, if you will, or even Google Apps for Education or other types of cloud-based applications to minimize the number of things that people print. And, and I think part of it is just a cultural shift, and, and a lot of it is just people used to a new way of doing things. And, and for example, you know, I'm old, and so I still print things. I don't even know why sometimes I print things. And I, to this morning is a great example of, of why, of, of what I meant that the I end up printing a, an email chain of stuff that I had that I'm going to for a meeting. I'm going to 11:30, and as soon as I hit the print button, I said to myself, "I'm going to have my Chromebook, or I'm going to have my mobile device, or I'm going to have my tablet, or whatever other else device that I have. I can easily just go into that at the meeting and just give that email. And I don't know why I print it. So, so a lot of this is is is, is mental resistance or, or cultural change, and. Uh, and I like to use my kids a lot in my examples and what I talk about. And, and my daughter's 18, my son's 10. I don't think they've ever printed anything. Um, and, and I don't even know if they know how to print. And so, and so the idea is that we start, we're starting to see that shift around teachers that are using and, 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 and uh, standards there talked about how he doesn't have to collect homeworks anymore, that they have to do them online or do an assessment online or teachers using the opportunity not just to save on printing, not just to not print, but it's a it's a cost it's a it's a time saving opportunity. And I'm gonna see lots of teachers use Google Docs for meeting notes, uh, the way lots of other organizations use them. So they can go in and create an ongoing meeting note uh, 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 sorry, notes for their meetings ongoing and keep that to their calendar so they're always adding notes to that and they don't have to actually print notes or an agenda or those types of things. So I'm excited to see how the technology, how software, how cloud-based applications, and now how these Chromebooks can help um, reach that printing experience that teachers face right now. Add on top of that is, you know, going into the, the Chrome Web Store, there's hundreds of different apps that um, you could use, and if I've used probably half a dozen of them, it's anywhere from 3D build tools to graphing calculators to really cool alchemy apps where you can just students can play around with different elements combining them and see what the output is. Um, the web is becoming so rich. Like I said about video editing earlier, programs like JCut where my students would be able to take their videos that they'd uploaded to YouTube, put them into JCut, and get these really high quality videos really simply. Um, and it's just a lot of fun to watch the power of the cloud. I think, you know, five years ago, maybe this probably wouldn't have been possible. But right now, everything that I used to do, either on a desktop or on a, on a Mac, I can also do on the cloud. And that was a realization that I didn't, didn't, didn't expect to happen when I started using the Chromebooks. And I went in with some, definitely some doubts. But that's proven, proven that I needed to do in my classroom. All right, so this is Jeff, and I think we've actually reached pretty close to the end of our time, and so I'd be respectful of the time you guys have. Uh, hopefully this has been a useful session for you to understand a little more about Chromebooks in the education context. There will be a recording of this webinar available along with the chat Q&A, and we will actually take the questions we have not gotten to today, either verbally or in writing, and put those answers for you as well so that you'll have a place to go for those. If you want more questions or to contact our sales team, uh, you can do that at google.com slash Chromebook. There's a, a way to get in touch with our sales team. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and attention. We really appreciate your attending today. And uh, yeah, back to the classroom. We hope to, to sell you some Chromebook.